Good morning. I'm Pastor Robin Hartwig. I'm very happy to welcome you to worship with the St. Andrew community. And the St. Andrew faith community is spread out across the world, just like we know as the church. We, uh, we always are the body of Christ in the world, not in the building, and that's even more true right now. Thank you for joining us from wherever you may be, whether it's close to this building on Butner Road in Beaverton or whether you are somewhere else far away from here. Thank you for being with us. If you would like to be even more connected uh, to this faith community, from wherever you are, you can be on our email list if you're not already by simply sending an email to office at strandrewlutheran.com. You can also visit the website at www.strandrewlutheran.com. Thank you again for the opportunity to get to know you a little bit better. I want to also say a word of thanks to uh, my fellow worship leaders in the uh, somewhat lonely sanctuary, but it is less lonely by virtue of the fact that our Minister of Music, Alison Katsafrakis, is leading us in song, and by virtue of the fact that we, uh, we just heard, actually, Susan Reiser and her sister, Carol Werner, uh, sharing the bell tree a prelude with us and wait for more music to come as a part of the service. And also thank you to Deacon Susan for accompanying our hymn singing as well. If you uh, did receive a copy of the worship folder by email, you'll recognize um, I'm not Pastor Mark Brocker when we get to the point of doing the sermon, uh, and uh, nor am I Donna Brocker. Sorry to the kids who are disappointed. I, I'm doing the children's sermon uh, today. We had a, a misprint there, uh, but I'm delighted to be with you and delighted now to be able to ground ourselves in God's life-giving presence through a moment of silence followed by confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God. We confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I'm welcoming the children to come forward from wherever you are at in front of your televisions or computers. Come a little closer and join me here at the baptismal font today. This is that special place where we welcome people into God's grace and into the family of Jesus. And maybe some of you out there uh, who are looking at a screen and seeing me now were actually baptized at this font. If you were baptized as a baby and you don't re remember if it was here or not, you can ask your parents or grandparents uh, if you were baptized here. And you're, anybody else is welcome to come and be baptized here too. We'll just have to work out the scheduling and all with the pandemic and the distancing. But what I was thinking of today, because it's Father's Day, is I was thinking about the many, many people 
including fathers and grandfathers who have been baptized in baptismal fonts just like this. Many of them maybe died, maybe you're, if you had grandpas or great-grandpas or great-great-grandpas, and just like many of us, they were baptized as a sign of God's love and grace for them, and then they passed on the faith to you and to me. Well, one of the people who uh, is still very much alive and I'm very grateful for is my father. And I brought this family tree that today I'm giving thanks for my dad as one of the people who was baptized many, many years ago and helped pass on the faith to me. And then there's other people who have already died and are with God in eternal life, and one of those people is my dad's dad. And so he goes here on this family tree, and his name was Walter. My dad is Jean, and his dad was Walter. And then his dad, that would be my great-grandpa now, his name was William, and he was baptized, not in this baptismal font, but one in actually Germany, if you can believe that. Okay, and these other two guys here, my dad and grandpa, were baptized at baptismal fonts in Iowa. So another person who was baptized at a baptismal font in Germany would be, let's see now, my great-great-grandpa, and this is, if you could be close, you could see a picture of him, and he goes right here, and he was also baptized at a font, uh, a baptismal font in Germany as a sign of God's love for him. So all of these are, are fathers in the faith who passed on, I could put my head right there on the top, right? Uh, passed on the faith to me. Now, of course, there's other people who go on this tree too, right? I've got a lot of the mothers and the grandmothers and the great-grandmothers. We love them too, and we know they passed on faith for sure. It's just today we're celebrating Father's Day, right? So we're going to save their story for a different day, like Mother's Day or All People's Day or Grandparents' Day. But for today, I am giving thanks along with you for all of those people who have been fathers to us or have shown us fatherly love, because when they show us love and when they pass on faith, they are passing on God in a real way into our hearts as well. Thank you so much for joining me here and wherever you are. The first lesson for today is from Romans chapter 6. Paul writes, Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we, who died to sin, go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. The word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 10th chapter. Jesus said to the twelve, 
A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, and even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise to the living word. Well, again, happy Father's Day to all of you fathers out there and to all of you celebrating Father's Day with the fatherly people in your life and remembering the fathers who have gone on before us. For those of you who are celebrating this holiday, I hope you will have some quality time spent with those you love, whether in person, perhaps outside, physical, physically distancing, or whether perhaps that's by some kind of webcam or telephone technology. I recognize that this is a strange and perhaps difficult Father's Day for many. Certainly, Father's Day can have emotions for those who never had a father or those who had fathers that did not meet their hopes or expectations or those whose fathers have died. But this year it's also difficult because many of the typical ways people celebrate Father's Day are not available. I suppose golfing or fishing might be a possibility still, but big gatherings of extended family over dinner in the dining room, probably not a good option this year. And if that weren't difficult enough, whose idea was it to assign this particular gospel passage from our three-year lectionary cycle of readings to this particular day? I mean, given that Father's Day generally falls right around this time of year, and that this reading, gospel reading, comes up right about this same time every three years, was there no better choice for this particular Sunday that so often falls on Father's Day than this passage in which Jesus tells the disciples, for I have come to set a man against his father, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Where's the good news in that? The time-tested tradition of Father's Day naps starts to look better and better when confronted with passages like this. With every additional challenging word from the mouth of Jesus, I don't know about you, but I grow increasingly weary. There's plenty to make us weary these days. As if these circumstances didn't make Father's Day complicated enough, I was reading the Christian Christian Century magazine online this week when the website served up another suggested article to me, this time by editor editor Peter Marty, 
This article calls into question the very purpose of celebrations like Father's Day and Mother's Day. The title of Peter Marty's article is, Has Family Become an Idol? I'm like, oh, are you kidding me this week? He says, the scriptures give us no sense that the family is an end in itself. Isn't one of the chief purposes of family to teach us to turn outward towards others? If you love only those who love you, Jesus said one time, what credit is that to you? In other words, so what? (laughs) There's nothing noble about spending all your energies of love on those closest to you or on those easiest and coziest to love. Peter Marty says, a recent Pew Research survey confirms that the number one source to which Americans look for meaning and fulfillment in their lives is the family. In fact, when it comes to those activities that provide a great deal of meaning and fulfillment, religious faith falls far behind spending time with family, being outdoors, caring for pets, and listening to music even. No wonder funeral eulogies often saturate listeners with the deceased person's adoration of family. In the Gospels, the family is always secondary to Christ's claim on his followers, Peter Marty points out. This message is hard for many believers to swallow. What Jesus implies is that fixating on love of family will not make one a disciple it may even get perilously in the way. And if that weren't enough, then there's this. Jesus says, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Did I mention that a nap is sounding better and better all the time this Father's Day? I'm not sure if Andrew Pryor is a father or not, but I know that he's an Australian blogger who gives voice to the challenge many of us might feel when hearing words like this today. He says, I often wonder what the lack of persecution in my life says about how little I have actually taken up my cross And each time I wonder about this, I am fearful. In talking about his own home country, Andrew Pryor says, despite our claims to being a peaceful and civilized country, we have built our society upon violence and still maintain it in this way. Witness the way we dehumanize refugees to maintain our own social cohesion or how still we are taking Aboriginal children from their families. The willful ignorance in Australia about its first people has now become the kind of intolerance that gets to the point where you can smash an entire group of humanity and there's no fuss. What am I not doing that I sit here in such comfort, he asks. We can probably relate to some of his questions in our own country these days following the killing of George Floyd while in the custody of four police officers. Most of us have known our entire lives that the sin of racism is a problem throughout our society. White parents have heard that when black parents have the talk with their children, it is not about the birds and the bees, but the talk is about how to stay alive if you get pulled over by the police. If those are not fears we have on a daily basis for ourselves or for our children, then perhaps it falls to us to ask how we are taking action to help our society engage in collective repentance over our country's original sin of racism. Perhaps Paul's instruction from today's lesson from Romans 6 is helpful here. He says, should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? It's as if Paul is saying, once we see it and we understand our part in it, we cannot go on living in the ways of death, whether racism or any other kind of personal or systemic injustice. 
We must change. Paul says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Ah, perhaps here, in these words from today's lesson from Romans, at long last is an actual invitation to something we can truly celebrate today on Father's Day without needing to take a nap. In Paul's words, Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father so that we too might walk in newness of life. We are all God's children, which means that we are all invited to pick up the phone, so to speak, and call out to the God who created all of us. We are already one family in God. This God did not create us to live in racist societies or to exploit any other human beings or the rest of God's creation. God did not imagine that we would grow to accept such systemic injustices as normal without finding ways to act differently, to be differently, to think differently. Jesus said, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body. We remember how Jesus referred to those who do the will of my Father in heaven as those who are his brother and his sister and his mother. Paul says, do you not know that all of us, all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death, buried by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so too we might walk in newness of life. There are so many things that we are missing during this time of pandemic, and not just on Father's Day, but pretty much daily. And it is also true that this pandemic is pulling back the curtain on some of the deep underlying injustices about our society and giving us an opportunity to see them, to confront them, to repent from them, and to take meaningful action toward restoration. That is what it means when Paul assures us that through our baptism into Christ's death and resurrection, this newness of life that he refers to isn't just a future reality after we join those who have died and gone before us. It is accessible to us now. All we need to do is simply remember to phone in to our heavenly father, our heavenly mother, our heavenly parent, our almighty God on a daily basis. Ask to be able to see clearly. Ask for forgiveness wherever we go astray. And ask for guidance on how to simply do the next right thing. Even when that next right thing is taking a nap first and then getting up and going after it again. Our divine father, our holy parent, doesn't just see families as we do with the fathers and grandfathers and grandmothers and and children who look like us and who come from the same place as us, but the family tree of God's love is big enough to embrace all. And in and as a part of that family, whether we are fathers or any other role in that family, God calls us to open up our hearts to receive the gift of God's grace that enables us to open up to that family as well. May we be able to celebrate this not only on the day when we give thanks for all of our fathers and grandfathers and those who have gone before us, but as we look out at the beauty of God's people and God's creation and celebrate the life of which we are a part. Amen.
We join together in heart and mind, bringing our prayers before you, O Holy Father, O Gracious Parent, O Life-Giving Spirit. O God, we thank you so much for our ancestors in faith who passed on faith to us. We thank you for your grace poured out for them and for us in the waters of baptism and by our birth through you into this beautiful creation. We pray for your blessings upon all faith communities, especially the people of St. Andrew as we prepare to meet an annual meeting this week. We pray for your blessings also upon all of those serving with us in the Oregon Synod, especially our saviors of Lake Oswego, King of Kings of Milwaukee, and Milwaukee Lutheran Church. We pray for blessings upon all of our interfaith partners, especially Congregation Kesser Israel, and for blessings on ecumenical ministries of Oregon and Holy Trinity Catholic Church. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all of those who are missing from our family trees, from our family tree of faith, those who cannot always be present with us when we worship, or those who are homebound and needing extra support during this time, Especially, we lift up to you Marlene, Dave, Jean, Tara, Grace, Doug, Betty, Dorothy, Phyllis, Ed and Jean, Helen, Dave and Sharon, Margie, and Nancy. We pray also for others who we do not even see as a part of our family tree many days those who are homeless, those who are affected by the coronavirus or sick in other ways, the unemployed and the financially burdened, and those who are victims of racial injustice and fear racial injustice every single day. We pray for your blessings upon public health professionals as they seek to minister to those who are ill. And we give you thanks for all the ways that you lead faith communities and our country to include again into our family trees those who need to be there. Especially we give you thanks for the Supreme Court ruling on DACA and the welcome it extends to the dreamers in our country. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for healing and recovery for Marlon Bell, Gladys Shervin, Brant, Carol, Nan Thompson, Jan, Doug Morrell, Phyllis Morris, John Sandquist, Chris Calhoun, Donna Brocker, Amy Figenbaum, Chris Entrekin, and we pray for your strength and support for Monique Luckock, Barry and Carol, and for successful surgery for Dick Parrish and for, Gor for Bob Corney. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for peace and comfort for all of those who grieve, especially family and friends of Fran Hansen, Nancy Schwebe, William Duvall, Majel Parker, and all victims of COVID-19. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we offer our prayers of thanksgiving for all of the blessings in the wilderness of our daily lives, especially giving you thanks for Pastor Susan Kintner's 40th anniversary of her ordination and giving you thanks for Leslie and Nilda's marriage yesterday. 
God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now in this silence, I welcome you to name in silence or aloud all others for whom you pray this day. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your wide and loving embrace, O God, we commend all for whom we pray, recognizing that in your divine love, you welcome all and you see all as a part of your family. Give us eyes to see as you do and let us put our faith into action in whatever ways you lead us. All of this we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So now we will take an opportunity to share in communion together. And if you do not already have some bread or a cracker, some wine or grape juice, I welcome you to go and and get that now. We typically celebrate communion uh, as scripture and as the teachings of our church encourage us by gathering around a common table in in the presence of one another. Until we can do that again, we are grateful to have an opportunity to celebrate online with one another, and we look forward to that day when we will once again gather together as an embodied and flesh community around the table to which Christ invites us. Please make ready your table now as I make ready this one. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy God, our maker, redeemer, and healer, in the harmonious world of your creation, the plants and animals, the seas and stars were whole and well in your praise. When sin had scarred the world, you sent Jesus to heal our ills and to form us again into one. And in the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his acts of healing, his body given up, and his victory over death, we await that day when all the peoples of the earth will come to the river to enjoy the tree of life. Send your spirit upon us and this meal, as grains scattered on the hillside become one bread. So let your church be gathered from the ends of the earth, that all may be fed with the bread of life, your Son. Through him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty God, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The body of Christ given for you, and the body of Christ given for me. The blood of Christ shed for you, and the blood of Christ shed for me.
We pray. God of the welcome table, in this meal we have feasted on your goodness and have been united by your presence among us. Empower us to go forth sustained by these gifts so that we may share your neighborly love with all through Jesus Christ, the giver of abundant life. Amen. take a few minutes here just to lift up some of the opportunities we have as a community of faith to be part of God's um, love and grace in the world. And you will find many of these opportunities listed here in the weekly news. Again, if you sign up for the email list, you will receive this every Friday. Thank you so much to Carol Harker for sending this out to us by email. 
Uh, you can also find it on the St. Andrew website at www.standrewlutheran.com. Uh, and again, you can sign up at office at standrewlutheran.com to receive it by email. This week is the annual meeting of the congregation done in a way this congregation has never done it before. That's Tuesday, June 23rd, and it will begin at 6.30 p.m. Please try to sign in to the Zoom online meeting technology 15 to 30 minutes early, and there is also uh, information about how you can be in touch with Rebecca if you want a little more mentoring on that technology if you haven't used it before. For. Please also continue to share with people that there is a way to simply dial in by telephone to, the, to hear the worship service, and that phone number is 503-643-9416. So if folks really uh, can't do the computer thing, there is still a way for them to participate in this weekly worship. Looking forward to Pastor Mark's Table Talk on Tuesday, June 30th at 7 o'clock p.m. via Zoom technology on the need for police reform. And so please let him know if you are planning to attend. Uh, today at 9.30 a.m., immediately after this service, the Mac G team, our, our St. Andrew Metropolitan Alliance for Common Good team, is having a... Um, uh, a, a little mini workshop, so to speak, on how you can be engaged in congregational phone calling. It's a wonderful way to support this ministry and to help St. Andrew be more connected and, and hear from folks about their experience of St. Andrew and how they are doing uh, during this whole pandemic. And so please uh, sign in to the, um, the main worship community meeting Zoom space, if you would like to join in that at 9.30. And then also, um, there is an adult education opportunity taking place at 10 a.m., beginning a short series on a time to grieve. And India Jensen Kerr will be teaching this class uh, beginning today and for a total of three Sundays. Today's theme is the act of grieving. Thank you so much to Deaconess India for teaching that. Wednesday evenings, we continue with evening meditation, uh, evening um, prayer service, and that's at 7 o'clock p.m., followed by centering prayer at 7.30 p.m. There's also at 6.30 informal gathering time for all who would like to uh, sign in and just have a chance to check in with some others from the St. Andrew community. Uh, super grateful to uh, Jan Smith and Elaine May for all of the recommendations of books and movies regarding racial justice. Perfect ways for us to all get further educated about this and also in anticipation of their next racial justice Zoom gathering as well. Are the, are the, did anyone else here have any other announcements for us? Not too many of you, but some of you could. Good. You'll find many others uh, printed in the, um, the weekly news, and um, you can also add your prayer concerns to our prayer chain uh, by visiting the website and clicking on the prayer request button, and then we will have those in our prayers for next Sunday as well. Now receive the blessing. Neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Go with love, go with joy, go with peace. The Spirit of God goes with you. Thanks be to God.